All right. Welcome back to Western Civ. The year is 1918. It is Germany's last chance. Germany's last chance to win World War I. It's been a terrible war, 1914, 15, 16, 17, and we're down to 1918. This is Germany's last chance, 1918. It's win or lose right here. They've decided that they must break France. This is that they recognize that Germany was at the end of its rope here. Both sides, in fact, both France and Germany are at the end of their rope as far as manpower goes. They're both down to teenagers and old men. Uh, the morale on both sides, um, the French army was cracking. We know that. They, there were mutinies in the French army. Not as much in the German army, but uh, both sides' morale was very low. And then war material. The Germans, they can't make tanks. There's not enough metal for that. They are down to the last of everything they have. And so the answer for them is to throw everything into one last offensive. 1918 is the year, one last chance, one last offensive to win this war. And they go back basically to the Schlieffen plan again, the idea that it's Paris. To defeat France, you have to aim at Paris. So the last attack here will be aimed at taking Paris. The idea is that if you can take Paris, this will cripple the French army. It'll fri cripple French morale, French communications. Everything about France depends on Paris. And then once this is done, once they can knock the French out of the war, the German belief is that the British will make peace or just back away. And the Americans have just arrived, so surely we'll know better than to engage with the Germans. We'll back away. This is the German hope in 1918. So as we go to the 1918, this is it. Everything into these last, this last offensive. The mastermind of it is Ludendorff. Hindenburg is the overall commander, but the mastermind is Ludendorff. He's been working on this plan of infiltrating the enemy. They did it against the Russians in the east. Now they'll be trying it against the French. They've been practicing it since 1917. 1917, they've been gathering the veteran soldiers and equipping them and training the infiltration ideas. And they launched their attack March 21st, 1918. It's springtime now. That's a, the weather's perfect for this now. They throw everything. 32 divisions. This is the last army that they can scrape together. 32 divisions uh, versus, and the place that they hit is going to be along the Somme River. This is the hinge between the British and the French lines. The British are up in Belgium, the French are around Paris, and this is where the hinge is, and they hit it. It goes off on March 21st. The uh, troops, the veteran troops had infiltrated behind the French lines, uh, cutting all kinds of communications back there, and then when the attack comes on March 21st, with just the teenagers armed with rifles, uh, the French army just collapses, and so does the British army. This is a really good um, plan by, by Ludendorff, this idea of infiltration, and it works. The Germans within 48 hours of launching this attack, they are 40 to 50 miles past the original trenches. They are, they've broken free. This hasn't happened since 1914. The Western Front's been stagnant, except now it seems, they seem to have opened this Western Front, and German troops seem to be on toward Paris. Here's a map of it. Here's the Western Front, this blue line, and you can see the attacks here. Here's one German attack there, and the German attack there, and then a smaller attack to the north and breaking across the French trenches into the open. Here's Paris down here, Paris right there, and the attacks are aimed toward Paris, and the Germans seem to be in the clear. And then it fails. The German attack fails. Initially a success for about the first 48 hours, but it turns into a failure. It just collapses. And here's the reason why. There's actually two reasons why. One reason is this. The American troops have entered the trenches not in, in not, a, not in opposition to this attack, but down toward the Swiss border. And so once they're in the trenches, this allowed the French troops to shift from that quadrant over to the guard, the better defenses around Paris. So the, the Germans have broken into the initial French defenses, but there's more French defenses backing up Paris because the American troops have allowed the French to shift. The second reason is this. After about 48 hours, the Germans have nothing left. A human can only go for about 48 hours before they just collapse. And so after about 48 hours, the German offensive collapses. They have no reserves. There's no one coming up to take the place of the veteran soldiers to keep driving on Paris. It just collapses on itself. Well, that's what the history book tells you, who's examined this in detail. But if you're a German soldier at the time, 
your reaction would have been one of disgust and dismay. How could this have happened? What's gone wrong? We were winning. This infiltration attack worked. We should have marched on to Paris. And there's a lot of hostility and anger and conspiracy theories abound. I put this picture up here because one of the guys involved in this attack is this man over here with the X above his head um, on this photograph is Adolf Hitler. He's a corporal in the German army and he is taking part in this attack. And he's not the only one who's going to just in disbelief of what's happened. In fact, uh, he'll be gassed in this attack and uh, end up in a hospital gasping for his life. And it's there later on. We'll talk about Hitler, uh, that he has his epiphany to save Germany. But uh, he's not the only one who has this reaction that the Germans, something's gone wrong and it's not the army and it's not Ludendorff. Something has messed up the German attack. As we continue on, uh, the Germans are just done for at this point. By July of 1918, uh, they actually try one more attack. This is uh, the Kaiser calls this the peace offensive. He needs his army to attack one more time so that um, he can make peace and uh, get out of this war. And it's a failure. This picture here shows you've got young soldiers and the, the morale is collapsed. They don't even attack in July. Um, the German morale is just gone. It's getting down to the point where the French had been. And, uh, the, and just like the, the, the French, the Germans will agree not to attack. They can't attack, but they will agree to build defenses. They will dig in, and this will be up to Americans to dig them out of this. And they will agree to defend Germany. So even though they're not making attacks against the French anymore because it's just useless, they do agree to defend Germany. It'll be tough. At this point in the war, as we go into the summer of 1918, this, this war is for all practical purposes over. Just looking at the material the French own the skies, the British own the skies, the German um, air, air Force is no more, and the tanks are rolling. In 1918, these tanks are just rolling. The G British are attacking with armies of hundreds of tanks. The French have some. The Americans were allowed to have a couple of tanks. So as we go into August of 1918, uh, we're just pushing them back now. This is the just nothing but Allied offensives, and we lead the way. America leads the way. USA, we have over a million troops on the line, and we'll be the ones having to dig the Germans out of their defenses. Again, here's a picture of the, the tanks, the British tanks just rolling across the German lines. They can't stop them. You might be able to stop one tank, but you can't stop hundreds of these British tanks. The German high command at this point recognizes this war is over. In fact, it's been over for a while, and we actually have letters and documents from the German high command saying things like this. Here's a, one of Ludendorff's letters. Uh, there is no hope of finding a strategic expedient to this war. There is no way we can win. This war must be ended. And then he resigned. He will resign on August 26th toward the end of the war. He's just done. He doesn't think he can do. He did his best in his mind. Uh, the Kaiser himself, here's one of his letters. We are at the limit of our power. This war must be concluded. So the high command recognizes there is no way to win this war. And meanwhile, the soldiers are just fighting to uh, hold ground as we drive them back. By September, the Allied offensive continue. Uh, we and the British are pushing the Germans back toward the German border, 10 miles a day in times, and the Germans are surrendering in droves. This month alone, 150,000 German prisoners surrendering to the Allies. That is mass surrenders of German troops. Our morale sky high. This war is definitely coming to an end. In our, in our view, there's no way the Germans can hold out. I want to mention a couple of American heroes. Here's uh, George Patton as a young officer in the um, World War I. He got a hold of a French tank and he'll be practicing tank warfare, which you'll see in World War II. And then this guy here, Sergeant York from Tennessee, our most decorated soldier in World War I, um, shooting lots of Germans single-handedly with a rifle. He's a good shot. And then capturing uh, over 100 Germans in one time. So pretty brave. By October, though, uh, this war is over. The Germans recognize it. We recognize it. Uh, the Kaiser does something here. He will offer a constitution to his people. He will offer the, to give away some of his rights if they will continue to fight. Um, he also, the Germans will contact Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, new to the game, the President of the United States, and the Germans contact him. And Wilson makes a reply to them. And this is quite interesting. You know, the, when you look at Allied warfare, that Wilson actually replied to them that if they'll accept the 14 points, he's willing to make peace. And we'll come back to these 14 points, but uh, the Germans immediately accepted this. Yes, 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 uh, the war should come to an end. We accept the 14 points. Um, when the British and French heard about this, they went crazy that uh, Woodrow Wilson's just showed up and making peace with the Germans. The British and French will 
categorically refuse to allow Wilson to meet with the Germans or contact the Germans, and then Wilson will issue the statement that, uh, sorry about that, uh, unconditional surrender. The Germans must surrender unconditionally. Forget about the 14 points. Uh, if you'd like to know some of Wilson's 14 points and why the Germans were so readily ready to accept his 14 points, I um, just want to mention a couple of them. I'm not going to ask you on the test to name these points. Just recognize what kind of uh, naivete Wilson demonstrates here at the end of the war. Point number one, there should be no secret treaties. This is what caused World War I in the first place in his mind. Secondly, there should be freedom of the seas. The British have owned the seas for too long. Uh, point number seven, skipping down to point number seven, uh, the Germans need to give back Belgium, which they were really ready to do. Point number eight, France will be the France of 1871, which would mean the Germans get to keep Alsace and Lorraine. You can see why the Germans would be happy about that, and the French would not be happy. And then points number 9 through 13 was something that was on the American mind, was all these empires and all these minorities of people have caused all this trouble that the, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, need to give away pieces of their territory, let their people be free, all through the Balkans. Uh, he responded to the Polish people. Poland needs to be a, a country to itself. And then finally, point number 14, there needs to be a League of Nations such that all the nations of the world can meet, such that if an archduke gets shot, we can uh, discuss things before the war breaks out. So it's very pie in the sky, very nice thoughts by our President Woodrow Wilson, but the British and French want to nothing of this. Um, one last thing to mention about the Germans, just kind of an interesting little tidbit here, is that the, uh, there was a mutiny in the German Navy in 1918. The high command within days of you know, the, the, the end of the Germans, uh, October 28th, we know the war's about to be over, um, they order, the high command ordered the German Navy out, basically in a suicide mission against the British blockade. Now, the German Navy had come out once in 1916. Uh, there was a battle off Denmark called the Battle of Jutland. Both sides fired their battleships, and then both sides went away. But this will be a suicide mission against the British blockade, a, a Götterdämmerung, a uh, Twilight of the Gods, a, a blaze of glory for the German Navy. In other words, we won't lose this war. We're going to die trying um, the sailors, before this, before this actually happened, the sailors on these German battleships began to form committees, and the committees that they did were called Soviets. They're picking up this Russian word. This is a communist word. They're starting to have communist ideas in the German Navy. The Kaiser's own Navy is dabbling in communism, and they will refuse the orders, and uh, there will be no great naval battle at the end of the war. And fortunately for everyone, this war is about to be over, November of 1918. Um, before it's over, though, the Kaiser himself will abdicate. He will just walk away from this. He will live the rest of his life in Holland. And then the final armistice is November 11th at 11 o'clock in the morning. They uh, meet with the Germans and um, will sign an armistice. Now, the word armistice means a ceasefire, stop shooting. That's all it means. The German general, when he goes to this meeting there to sign this armistice, mentioned the 14 points, right? We're, we're dealing with 14 points here. Of course, the British and French aren't, aren't doing that. Just sign an armistice. We'll talk about that later, maybe. Um, one thing to mention here is that this is in November, so it's the winter of 1918 as we go into 1919, and the British keep the blockade up through the winter. This will be a terrible winter. There was already starvation in Germany, and through the winter of 1918 into 1919, there'll be even worse starvation. There's even a flu epidemic that will kill millions. And so this, the war's not over. Again, the war's not over. If the war were over, the British could take the blockade down. But this is just a ceasefire. And the German army, already being deprived and, and just fading away, will completely fade away through the winter of 1918 into 1919. The army will just disappear. So what was an armistice becomes basically a collapse. What happens for the peace treaty is interesting here. The Big Four will meet at Versailles. Here's your Big Four. Here's Woodrow Wilson, our president. There's the president of Italy. Italy was an allied power. And then the uh, president of France and the prime minister of England will be meeting at Versailles just outside of Paris to discuss what to do about Germany. Now, Woodrow Wilson's very pie in the sky, but these other guys aren't so much. And let me just run this by you real quick, just some of the death and destruction that they've seen for their countries. The French... And again, these statistics, you don't need to be able to repeat on the exam. I just want to show you the mindset of the Big Four, not Wilson, but the Big Four meeting at Versailles. The French suffered 
over a million dead, over four million wounded. Let's just add that up and kind of round up. Let's round it up to uh, about six million, about six million dead and wounded. That is a lost generation. That is every man in France from 15 to 30 has been basically gone or wounded or messed up. Germany, about the same. Um, the German death numbers are a little bit higher. That would indicate probably the blockade, that their soldiers weren't getting as much medicine as the Allied soldiers, but basically the same as France. And then the Russians, uh, they were only in the war for 1914, 15, 16, two and a half years, and they suffered just unbelievable. We don't even know if those are correct, but probably correct for just two and a half years. You can see why they went into revolution in 1917. And then for Americans who are only really fighting, we got into the war in 1917, but really only in combat through the last six months of 1918 starting in, say, May or June of 1918, are we actually in combat, and we will suffer 50,000 killed, 200,000 wounded. That's a lot less than these other countries have experienced. We uh, did not go charging into machine guns like they did in 1914. So, but it's still pretty heavy casualties, although our morale was very high in World War I. Um, also, I want to mention the chaos. As these big four are discussing the peace treaty and what to do about Germany, you're having empires collapse. The Russian Empire went first. We know that in 1917. The German Empire collapses. The Kaiser abdicates. The Austro-Hungarian Empire will collapse. And then last, the Ottoman, staying up much longer than expected. The sick man stayed up the longest, actually. But when those empires go down, the war isn't over for them. There's all kinds of chaos. You've got these armed soldiers coming home to no government. And chaos ensues as these armed soldiers come home and want to establish some kind of law and order. Let's look at the treaty that they come up with. The Big Four come up with a Treaty of Versailles, and they'll present it to the Germans. Uh, there was no German participation. It would just be done by the Big Four and handed to the Germans. They'll be forced to sign it. They found someone to sign it in June of 1919, actually the exact date of the assassination, June 28th. So it's been five years since the assassination of the Archduke, and here's the final peace treaty that they got a German to sign. Part one of it, and I'm not going to hold you responsible for knowing part one, part two, part three, but watch what happens and understand the treaty. First of all, Woodrow Wilson gets his baby in there. Uh, there will be a League of Nations. To lead the treaty off, there's going to be a League of Nations. And then uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, the, the British and French, will do this to Germany. Part two is the redrawing of Germany, and it's not nearly as bad as you might expect. They lose just a little bit of territory. They lose Alsace and Lorraine back to France. Okay, that was expected. And then in the east, they'll lose a large chunk to a new country called Poland that pops up and a new country of Lithuania that pops up, losing territory to those countries. And then a little off the top, they'll lose a little bit to Denmark. So that's really not terrible. They lose this back that they gained in 1871, a little bit from the east, not too much, and then a little off the top. So it's not terrible for Germany. They didn't dice Germany up and remove them from the map. Part number three is there'll be a DMZ between France and Germany. You know, these two countries have fought two wars now in the last 40 years. There will be a DMZ between France and Germany. It will be along the Rhine River. The Germans will not be allowed to have defenses close to France. If they start moving any sort of military toward France, there will be an act of war. So there's a DMZ. This will give the French, hopefully, a heads up if the Germans try to attack. Part number four is not too bad for the Germans. They lose all their colonies. Well, they didn't have too much to begin with, but they're not an empire anymore. And then part number five, the army. This is big. This is really big. This will basically uh, move the German army to 100,000 men. That's the limit. This will mean that Germany is an unarmed country. They are unarmed. This is basically nothing more than a police force for, in case someone attacks them. Uh, the navy will be taken away. The Kaiser's beautiful battleships will be distributed to the Allies to do with what they wish. And German navy will be limited to a coast guard, just small coastal uh, vessels. No U-boats declared a terror weapon the Germans had used. Uh, the irony here is that the Americans and everybody will be using them in World War II. And then no air force. Germany will be a no-fly zone, not allowed to have any sort of airplanes flying around. The German word for air force is Luftwaffe, not a test question at this point, but I just want to throw the word out there because in World War II you're going to see the German Luftwaffe play a big role. Um, and then no tanks. The British recognize that this is the new way of war. You've got to have tanks if you're going to wage war in the future, and the Germans are not allowed to have tanks. And then finally, let's wrap it up here with uh, Article 231. Again, I'm not going to ask you what number this was, but it's a, toward the end of the treaty, the last part of the treaty, is the famous war guilt clause. 
that there's a clause saying someone is guilty of war. And the answer is Germany. Germany and the central powers are guilty of waging a war of aggression. They started it. And so, if you're responsible for starting a war, you're also responsible for the consequences. And the word indemnity will come up. And part number nine is going to be the indemnity, the financial obligations. And the number doesn't come out immediately. It'll take a few years to get this number complete because all the uh, accountants need to be brought in. And so what we need to look at here is not just military casualties. Uh, we need to look at widows. We need to look at paying for orphans. We need to look at the destruction in Belgium, the destruction of eastern France, the destruction of the lost wages, the lost income. Uh, parts of eastern France will never be the same, never be used for uh, farming again. Cities were destroyed. So it takes a long time for these financial obligations to finally come, and the number finally comes in at somewhere in the $32 billion range, which literally is more money than existed in the world at that time. It's a number that is so huge that Germany will never pay this off ever, it seems. Um, and so it is just simply crippling Germany to the point of a helpless state, and then financially to a state that can't even take care of itself. It owes every money it makes to the Belgians or the French or the British or Americans or the Italians. Somebody is going to just take all of Germany's money. So people leave the Treaty of Versailles and think, hmm, uh, is this too harsh of a treaty? Is it not harsh enough? And uh, we'll see where this leads. It's going to lead to uh, dictators in Eastern Europe. And here's our new map of Europe here. Germany still there, not too short, not too small. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire diced up, and the Allies become winners down here. Yugoslavia, the Slavs, the Serbians, again, their huge state. Romania came in on the right side and gets huge. Bulgaria becomes small, and the Turks will continue to exist. So um, lots of uh, winners and losers at the end of World War I.